when you say Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah and you say them for the first time, they fall from your mouth like the the mightiest of rocks. I rang them their office and I said, you know what, I'm really, really grateful, but I've realized I can't do it with alcohol in the room. The dua of the oppressed, subhanAllah, the weight that it carries in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, because all the people of Gaza were praying for you. We said, let's pray for Sister Laura Booth to become Muslim. And honestly, I felt that I had a hand on my back pushing me towards Islam. And was it that dua? Wallahu alam. The mainstream media has been justifying genocide in Gaza. Islamophobia and censorship are the norm. We're changing that. Our journalism has reached over 300 million impressions on social media since October the 7th. On TV, our rolling news coverage has featured key figures like Hussam Zomlot, Avi Shlaim, Gideon Levy, Jeremy Corbyn. We need your support to reveal the truth and ensure our voices are heard. Donate today at support.islamchannel.tv. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to podcast here on Islam Channel. Every, every episode we have a, a guest who is really changing things up, somebody who is adding tremendous value to our community uh, and somebody who's perhaps we don't know too much about but really if we were to delve deeper and dig deeper into their lives we'll see how important they truly are to the work uh, that's being done currently in the community. Now, today's episode is no different. Today we have Sister Lauren Booth, who is an actor, an author, an activist, a broadcaster, a journalist, and social media influencer. And she has been dedicating her time to creating space for authentic Muslim narratives. What you may not know is she trained as an actress at the London Academy of Performing Arts and then spent several years touring Europe with various regional theatre companies. Now, with over 25 years of experience in the print and broadcasting industry, Laura now focuses her skills on producing and presenting online content that highlights crucial social issues and historical narratives often hidden from view. So please join me in welcoming Sister Laura Booth. Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Asalaam. Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh to you and all your listeners. It's so good to have you here. It's been actually a while since we've met. I've known you for quite some time, actually. I think prior, prior to 2010. 2010. Did you know me before I came I to Islam? Is that yes. what you're saying? Yes, How? I did. Where? I think I met you somewhere. Probably uh, anti Iraq war. Maybe. Events. We'll get onto that, the, okay. uh, these events, because, you know, the, these are really uh, momentous occasions in your life, aren't they? My sister, so you, you have so many accolades to your name. Uh, again, somebody who has acted, authored books, you're an activist, you're a broadcaster, you're a journalist, you're on social media. Uh, you've recently moved to Turkey as well and, and really you're sharing some amazing stories and content from a country that we know but we actually we don't know enough about but it's so rich in its heritage and its culture. Uh, so I just want to tell you a, a little bit about the mm. road that I live on, on because then. I've lived all around the world by the grace of Allah alone and um, I decided with my husband, we agreed that we would live in a Turkish street. We did not want to do that expat thing of a high rise. Uh, you know, it's all plush, but there's no kind of, I hate the word vibe, but no kind of authenticity, let's say. So by the grace of Allah, we've got a very religious area. We're in a back street, but the name of the area, or as it's known locally, is the place of no salam, right? The place of no peace. Why is it known as the place of no peace? Because um, it's, there's, a, there, there's a certain poor poverty community there and there's a lot of noise at night and there's a lot of noise during the day and we love it. It's really fascinating mm. because we're learning about the culture of life. So for example, I'll look out of my window at the building opposite and you will still see from the top floor hampers being lowered down on ropes by old ladies who get their bread delivered that way because they still don't have elevators. And then there's the cat life. There are a thousand cats in our road and it all looks charming in those lovely w videos on Instagram. But at night, Oh, the fights and the madness and the mayhem that they bring. The seagulls, we've had battles with seagulls. And then there's the guy who comes round, the rag and bone man. 
of the 21st century. And he makes this sound, um, Eddie Freddie Bo, Eddie Freddie Bo. And he does that at, from <laughs> six in the morning to 11 at night. And so, and at the end of our road is Karacha Ahmed, which is the largest um, graveyard in Istanbul, if not the whole of Turkey. One million souls are buried there. Just get your head around that city of the dead, including wives of some of the sultans, including some great scholars and clerics. And it is a wonderful place to walk and to consider where we are and where we're going. That's our area. So it's the old and the new. It's not dissimilar to Ilford, really. Yeah, it is. It's Ilford. <laughs> Place of no peace. Yeah. Rag and bone men. <laughs> cats screaming and fighting yeah. at night time. You're right. Uh, but but oh. we have Amazon delivery, so that's probably something you may not have right now. Yeah. Has, has that made it there down your street? I don't deli- I don't try to use Amazon. Try not to, yes, yeah. absolutely. There's certain things that, you know, we shouldn't tolerate, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes the uh, tr- traditional yeah. life is sometimes is always the best, isn't it? But we'll get onto that because we talked about technology earlier as well. But I'd like to go back because I, I know, I understand that you started journalism back in, in 97. So this is uh, at least, what, 13 years prior to mm-hmm. Uh, converting to Islam. So tell me, how, how did you get into journalism? Was it something you wanted to do? Is it, w- w- did you always have an interest in journalism? Well, look, I trained as an actor and acting is the most amazing, amazing calling. My dad, who was an actor, always told me... Your dad is a famous actor. Famous actor. I mean, this is just not just anybody. Let's put it this way. He was the Brad Pitt of 1960s and early 70s and, Britain. And this is Anthony Booth, also known as uh, lovingly Tony Booth. Tony Booth, yeah. Women some... would fall over, fall faint in the street when he walked past and I'd be holding his hand as a seven-year-old. I can, I can understand. He was a handsome man, let's <laughs> he put was. it that way. Um, but he always said to me, look, kid... If you want to become an actor, know that it's a vocation, not a vacation, because we are as essential to the life and the spirit of a nation as nursing, Mm. because we are the ones who tell the stories that matter and we spiritually nurture the nation. And so take it seriously. And, And he said, if at any time you're not willing to die in a garret for your art, leave because somebody else behind you is. So after, so I trained as an actor, I did some small tours here and there. I did, uh, you know, a couple of walk-ons on EastEnders and things like that. And it really wasn't getting anywhere. Mm. And so I thought about my dad's words. And I also thought, you know what? Being unemployed is horrible. And is this, am I really going to sit the rest of my life waiting to play a single mum with two lines on the bill as it was back then, right? Or whatever is the, you know, the current series I thought I'm I'm sure I've got I've got something more in me and I'm really interested in politics. So I retrained. I retrained. I was an early retrainer and I I did a night course in journalism and um I lasted 6 weeks before getting kicked out. Why did you get kicked out? Why did I get kicked out? Because um I wrote my first interview and uh it was an interview assignment that we had. And the lecturer sort of said, uh, uh, Lauren, let me speak to you. And at the end, she said, this is brilliant. You can write. You're obviously politically connected. So you can get into Fleet Street. She said, please don't waste your time. I've got nothing to teach you. Go out and get a job. Isn't that amazing for a lecturer mm. to do that? And I did. I I, um, I went in and, and I started when Princess Diana died. My first that was in ninety seven. Ninety seven. Oh, yeah, I did a story for I think it was was it the Sunday Mirror about the lookalikes, the Diana lookalikes not having jobs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so embarrassing. <laughs> but you have to start somewhere, right? It was so such such, such a naff piece. It didn't even make it into the Sunday Mirror. But I was I was I was on the got to start you know? somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. So so at that point, how long did that? last that um uh, your time at that paper that was just a training that was just about six weeks and then the evening standard offered me a column about uh, a girl about town it was very much ladet culture mm. and i was like uh you know i was hanging out with zoe ball and people like that in various everybody saw me and everybody knew me and it was and i was doing interesting things so that's easy mm. to write about if you understand words but you say people knew you but why did they know you they, they knew me because I was related to Tony Blair, but also because I was noisy and gobby mm. and always uh, opinionated and always 
um, you know, making, turning up at protests and, and being passionate. People like authenticity. Yeah, you, you, success for me has always been being authentic and true to your voice. It's, it's not about numbers on a sheet. So while you were, as a, as a journalist, being related to Tony Blair, obviously th mm. as his wife is your half-sister, mm -hmm. I understand. But then at the same time, you're somebody who was known in their own right uh, as somebody who's quite outspoken, opinionated, an activist. How... How did, I suppose, did you care how, or did Tony actually care? I'm going to call him Tony. But did, did he care at all about how you were coming across and, and I suppose, how you were acting in, in public life? And almost openly, you were protesting against him and his policies at the time, because this is where we were coming towards the, the Iraq war. With, with, the, with the benefit of distance, I can see that actually, I think... Tony and Cherie were trying to protect me because they could see that I was really naive, although I was around 27 years old. Mm -hmm. I know I was 30 and 97, gosh, but I wasn't part of that Fleet Street world and they wanted to eat me alive. They mm -hmm. wanted me to, one, bash the Labour government and two, be humiliated and humiliating. I couldn't see that at the time. I'm like, oh, Piers Morgan, what a nice guy. He's a bit of a laugh. And so it's like, you know, and I always thought that there was a certain amount of venom there and I wouldn't trust them, but everybody, I couldn't see the woods for the trees. I couldn't see other people's criteria. And that's a level of naivety that's very dangerous. And I do remember uh, around 98, 99 at the Labour Party conference, at a bar, Auzu Bilair with Piers Morgan and, um, oh, what was his name? David, somebody who was the head of The Sun at the time. And um, the, the, the editor of The Sun looked at Piers Morgan and said, oh, I can't, no, he looked at me and he said, I can't wait to write about you and splash you on the front page because we're going to annihilate you. This is people that you're You said having, that to your yeah. fans. And, and I turned to Piers and I said, you wouldn't do that to me, would you, mm. Piers? And he said, absolutely not, Lauren. I'd call you first mm. for your side of the story. Well, he showed his true colours as a, as a recent, hasn't right? he? Right, and so you start to get a feeling of, I'm out of my depths. And I say, and, and for a good five, six years, I was out of my depths, trying to learn my craft, trying to do what was true and useful with my voice that had accidentally found me by the grace of Allah, but in amongst the sharks. Did, it's a, perhaps a strange question, but do you think people trusted you? Because again, the, the reason why I say that is for somebody who is so connected to a leading political figure, as you know, did they did they trust that these were your genuine feelings and sentiments, or do you feel that you were just rebelling against somebody you just didn't like? No, I don't think it's about me. I think in that world, who is genuine? What does that even mean? Everybody either has a wish to be in a position of power or wealth, and preferably wealthy with power. And they will do what they need to do to get to that place. And so the way, the way that that is delineated is people just kind of, you know when, when you see these sci-fi movies, it's like... I don't know why I did that kind of <laughs> closing doors. That's a Starship Enterprise. <laughs> it's meant to be. I'm doing with my hand a kind of um, the, a, a, a taser, kind of like, um, you know, when you uh, try to, um, the numbers of somebody come yes. up, like, you know, 20 points for accuracy, two points for confidence, whatever it is. Yes. Um, so I'm kind of trying to imitate that. Everybody is looking at themselves in that way. And so I was just, people... I was just one of the crowd. I was just like, who is this new arrival who drinks too much, is way too loud, her skirt is too short, she's way too opinionated, what does she want? And how can we help her get there whilst using what she has? That's that world. That's very disturbing. True or not true, you're in it. You're in it. No. Come on. No, I, no, I agree. I agree. I, I, would say, I would say that there are, there are, there, there aren't, it's very difficult to trust people in this industry when it comes to film and TV and media in general, because you're not always sure what their ulterior motives are. The insecurity about likes and clicks, that was just starting to come in when I was at the Daily Mail and the Mail on Sunday, as comments under the, the piece started to matter. Before that, you were 
you know, people were free to be, have journalistic credibility. You wrote a really meaningful article. You were a John Pilger. You were a Robert Fisk, or you were whatever that version is in, in, in your area. And it didn't matter in a way what other people said, as long as you had good accuracy and good respect in your circle, right? Then it became, why are the, why are the public having the right to comment on this? And then it became, the public comments influence what you say. Mm -hmm. What I and I know a lot of people who who know of you but don't know enough about you will will always want to be asking that question around where did your first exposure to Islam where, where, when did that happen and and how, how how did you view Islam as somebody you know approaching you know two thousand and ten which is the year in which you became Muslim what was your view and how did you feel about Muslims I think it's and really, the community I think it's really important to, to acknowledge that. Even today, most British people know nothing about Islam and many don't care to know. So um, I went to a girls' school in uh, North London called Coptal and we did that usual kind of interfaith sort of religious studies and they would have done, you know, two weeks on Hinduism and two weeks on Islam and so it kind of gets confused because you've got Asian girls in your class and they all, they all have long hair and they all have weird names. I'm putting this into a 1970s, 80s context, by the way. I can hear my daughter going, don't say that, it's racist. <laughs> Clearly not racist. It's your observation, it's observation the time, of course. now. Okay, so I'm observing from a past viewpoint because you asked me about my past. I didn't get that there was a difference between Hinduism and Islam. Um, it all seemed alien and foreign and probably quite colourful and meant that girls had to get married young, um, probably become doctors as well, and they ate curry. And that was my view on Islam until about 2003. Until 2003? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Oh, yeah, my goodness. Actually, maybe oh, until 9-11, yeah. maybe until 9-11, I think when the Twin Towers were uh, fell, I remember, because I wrote this in my diaries, a lot of this isn't my memory, it's that I wrote stuff down, thanks God. And if, you know, write stuff down, guys, keep diaries. You, you never know why they're important. But when I watched the Twin Towers come down, I remember thinking, which poor nation is going to get the stick for this? I didn't know. Did you immediately think, oh, it's Muslims? Yeah. Why? Yeah. There was obviously a kind of vibe going on in the newspapers at the time, probably about Libya was a big one, probably a little bit about Iraq. It was Saddam, wasn't it? It, it, was, um, it was the Taliban. And I read a lot of newspapers. I was in that news circle. So I, so, so I remember guessing it was going to be a poor country and it was going to be a Muslim country who were going to be blamed, whether they did it or not. And, that, and, I, and I suppose like a lot of non-Muslim people... I then started going, well, what is this all about? Are these crazy people? And by the grace of Allah, because of my, because I uh, spoke at anti-Iraq war rallies, I began to be brought into the Muslim community. And what I saw was like night and day. And a, a lot of my early experiences were here at the Islam Channel. Mm. By the grace of Allah. Can I share one with you? Yeah, please. I remember uh, being offered a job here in around 2006 by Muhammad Ali, who was the CEO. Mm. And we met, by the way, I was a religious kid. This won't make sense unless I tell, it, tell, you, tell you guys that I always believed in God. I didn't know how he was. I didn't know who he was. You can acknowledge there was a, a greater, a higher being, greater presence. Yeah, I would always pray. My mum called me a weird kid and I said, why, why, why would you say that? She said, oh, you're always praying, dear God, dear God. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I remember that, reading the Bible at break times. Yeah, I wasn't popular at school. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so when I start we're, we're at this interview with Muhammad Ali, we go in and it was around Dean Street at the time when with the old offices, the old studios. Carl Arundel was there. Mm. He's still, I think he's, is he still here? I believe so. Carl, yeah. right, okay. So um, they invited me to have a kind of lunch meeting. And I went in and the first thing I did, and I, it's so embarrassing to say this, but I say this to, to kind of reflect upon what Britishness is, okay, and what, what liberals are like deep down what liberals are like okay deep down because we think they're all like you know we want them to be nice and we want them to be 
It's not the case. It's not the case. It's not the case. Basically, as soon as Muhammad Ali sat down, I did this to the waiter. Waiter, a bottle of wine, please. <laughs> now, I knew he was a religious guy. He, Whether he had a thobon or not, I, I knew enough. I recognised he had a beard. It was the Islam Channel interview. I knew Muslims didn't drink, yet I ordered a bottle of wine. Now, in my diary... It was, was that just kind of, you know, unconsciously, unconscious? Two things. Okay. Partly unconscious in that I had never had a meeting in my adult life without being partially yeah. drunk. That's the truth of it. Or at least a little bit, you know, fizzy around the edges. But why a bottle? I thought, well, I'm going to show them that I don't have to be Muslim. And if they want me on board, I was basically Charlie, Julia Hartley Brewer. Oh, God. Oh, God. Wow. I thought I was liberal. Looking may, back at it now. May Allah. Allah. May, may Allah swan salab, obviously, just, I mean, from changing you from that to this, alhamdulillah. It's crazy, isn't it? So Muhammad like, Ali, wow. he very politely said... And this is how we can change people's hearts with our, with our authenticity, with our reality, with, with putting Allah first. He said, uh, Miss Booth, before you have your wine, I have to say, um, as a Muslim, I can't sit here while you drink it. Mm. But you go ahead. It's fine. Carl will pay. Carl went, why am I paying? <laughs> he said, he's not Muslim because the Islam channel won't pay. And mm. I'll just come back when you're done. Mm. And he went outside, and in my memory, it was a bit blowy, and he's on the phone, and he's out in the street, and I'm drink, about to drink wine, and I had a stabbing heart pain. And as an actor, you're used to kind of assessing yourself. Maybe this helped me to Islam. Wallahu alam, a lot of creatives come to Islam because you, you do live a lot in the emotional realm. You do kind of adjust and think about you yourself do. in that way, right? Creative. So I thought, oh, what is that pain? And I realized what it was. It was shame. And I thought, oh my God, when did that little girl who used to pray, and when did that person who, who wanted everybody to live freely and be okay and looked after become someone who would totally disrespect a religious person in order to get drunk? What's happened to me? So I sent the wine away and we had the meeting. And um, I remember saying as well at the same time, um, two things I've got. I've got two conditions about before I take this job. They wanted to meet me to be an, an interviewer with the Islam Channel. I said, number one, um, don't ask me to be Muslim. I like you guys, patronizing. I, I like you people, pat on the head. You're very nice, mm. but it's not for me. I have my own way of life. Muhammad Ali said, Allah Taala knows whether or not you will be Muslim, and you do not know. And I said, no. I do know. <laughs> I know your 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 version of God doesn't. Yeah. Know. Thank you, but no thank thanks. Thanks, but no yes. thanks. And we agreed to disagree on that. And then I said, secondly, um, don't try. I won't wear hijab because I think it's hypocrisy. Um, because I'm Christian. Now I didn't know the weight of the word hypocrisy, mm. and it. I'll have to ask him one day. Is that what touched your heart? Because he said, okay, don't wear hijab and do the show. And to this day. I'm the only female presenter not to be in hijab. And look how it worked mm. out. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So that patience with somebody who doesn't know, that that accepting of who they are, but helping them through it, maybe maybe that's the mm. lesson here. So moving on from that, 2010 is the year in which you became Muslim. What can you tell us about the journey that led up to you taking the shahada? Well, interestingly, because I, because, because I was at the Islam channel, I remember one night uh, I was due to, to do some filming and I was sitting in the green room, which is kind of a waiting room area. Mm. It was a bit grotty, to be honest. Uh, but anyway, they had a coffee machine and I was getting ready to meet some kind of celebrity pals and may Allah forgive me, get absolutely smashed. And I knew it was going to be a 4 a.m. version of life. This is about nine o'clock at night. And as I sat in the waiting room, I looked opposite me and there were three Qaris, mm. three young kids, either Bangladeshi or Pakistani, I don't remember, but they had white thobes on, white topis, and they were going over the Quran. And I promise you, they were like angels to me. Mm. They had so much light about them and they were only like 18 or 19 years old. And I looked at them and then I went out and looked in the street and I looked at them and I went out and looked in the street, people smoking and getting ready on a Friday night. And I thought, these people are from God. Mm. This is beautiful. It's and I'm not in a beautiful state. Mm. What is wrong with me? You felt that there's some kind of inner conflict. Yeah. Between how you wanted to be and how you really felt. Yeah. Subhanallah. Yeah, some, there, was, there was 
there was truth in what they were saying. Mm. And maybe, well, I well, it was the Quran they were reciting as well. Remember that, and that has an effect mm. on every human heart. So, what, what can you tell us about the the, the time though, the day that you took your shahada, and and maybe tell us about how your family felt about it because you've got two mm. two lovely daughters mm. as well. Can you t tell us well, more about that? Well, what was funny was I was a single mum at that time. This is 2010. And I was um, going through a really messy divorce. It was a very difficult time. And um, single mums, often we, we overshare, perhaps with our kids. But we also have nice conversations around the kitchen table. So I had two daughters, age eight and 10. And because I was working with the Islam channel, I'd come home every other day and go, oh my God, they're nice people, the Muslims. Oh, you'll never guess what happened today. <laughs> and honestly, it's very simple things like somebody just, you know, well, would you like something? How can I carry your bag? Why would you carry my bag? I'm 35 years old. What's wrong? Well, okay, just a bit of love. And I'd come through this very ugly media scene mm. to a place of love. Even, and I want to say this to ourselves as Muslims and remember that when we practice sardine, the least of us is better than the best of some of, of another nation because we're doing what we do for Allah. So it has a beauty to it. That's not to say there's no beauty in other places. I sat next to a Lib Dem counselor the other night who made me cry, such a beautiful human being. But we have the practices of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I was coming home and I was speaking to my kids about Muslims. Um, I'd been to Palestine um, two or three times to break the siege. I'd been to Gaza. That, that was the, that was the, when the, was it the, um, the peace convoy? It was before that, it was 2008, mm -hmm. and it was called Free Gaza. Mm -hmm. And we had some boats leaving from Cyprus, two boats. We made it into Gaza by the grace of Allah. Yvonne Ridley was on there. That's boat. right, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, she Allah frightened me to well. death. May Allah bless her. She and I, two really, you know, strong females on the boat. Formidable, Formidable. the two of you together. I'm yeah, sure. Sure, she terrified me <laughs> uh, <laughs> in a wonderful way. I ended up being there a month. And it was such a blessing. It was um, Ramadan. And, um, you know, it just became in my heart, really. It became like home because the um, mm. Egyptians, I tried to leave through the Egyptian border. And I remember the Egyptian guard um, of the um, oh, Mubarak regime looked at my passport and said, oh, so you're Lauren Booth. He said, you like the Palestinians, don't you? I said, yes, I do. I support their cause. He said, well, good news. And he closed my passport and handed it to me. He said, you live with them now. Mm. You can't leave. And honestly, I, it was like I was in an elevator and it dropped 60 floors in a second because my kids were in France. Mm. What had I done? And then I tried to leave through um, the Israeli side and, uh, you, you know, they had guns and don't come here again. It was really strange. Well, was that, in a way, was that confusing for you? Here you're in a Muslim country, which is Egypt, and you would yeah. be expecting them to say, we're with you, we, you know, we support you, you know, even if it's on the hush hush, but for them to just be openly supporting the oppression. Well, this individual, obviously, and giving you back. No, no, no. It was so. it was a lot of support. It was it completely confused me. I'm like, how can the Arabs? Okay, I know there's a problem with the Israeli side, but how are the Arabs so horrible to their brothers and sisters? Did, did this make on the other side? Did of this a wall? make you question Islam though, and thinking, hold on, this is a confusing religion because they don't even understand. No, because I knew they weren't they weren't doing it. Whatever wh whatever mm. Islam was, this guy wasn't doing it. So you were able to identify, actually, this is not from Islam. This yeah. This is not from the faith. Yeah, no way. Because, because that can be dangerous sometimes because be. people get confused mm. and they see, they, they typically say, well, look, I've seen somebody with a big beard, yeah. uh, obviously a male, who's, uh, <laughs> who's doing something wrong here and is Muslim. And because of that, I don't want to, or someone who's wearing hijab, they're acting the certain but that, way. But that, will, that, that, that will happen if you ha haven't been exposed long enough to the beauty mm. and the beautiful behaviours. It's a very And remember, point. I had been three and a half weeks in Gaza in Ramadan and had seen, and I thought these people were aliens. I'm like, mm. how can you be so nice? So this experience, Alhamdulillah, Allah gave Alham this beautiful experience, which Alham itself Alham. perhaps was that foundation being laid for what happened in 2010. So after you become Muslim in 2010, do you feel your world changed? What changed for you? Mm. Subhanallah. Did, did you feel this complete change? Yeah. Like, 
everything day changed. Night, day everything after, has really changed. Summer. Everything. Every cell in my body, every thought. It took time. I, 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 want, I want to explain something, actually. When you say Shahada, um, and I was 44, I'd been 44 years in dunya. And when you say Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah, when you say the words Allah and Ashhadu, and you say them for the first time, they fall from your mouth like the the mightiest of rocks. Mm. It's like it's like an avalanche of 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 stonework. They fall, and it, it's like a thunderclap. That's how it feels. I testify. Dung. It's a, what's that sound? The Allah alone you know is my lord that's a huge statement and and as somebody who's been muslim long enough now to skip over it i call myself to account mm. and say allah these words and i testify oof, that muhammad you're saying them when name muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam when you say his name mm. for that first time you can you can only imagine what is going on in in jannah while this yeah. is all happening. Yeah, it does. It feels like that. I testify that Muhammad is the last and final prophet of Allah, the messenger of Allah. You feel that you've said something mighty mm -hmm. and you go away with that inside you. But here's the interesting thing. That although you are a Muslim, the second you say you're shahada, you're not a good person. You still have all of those years that you're forgiven. So you're forgiven. So Allah's forgiven you. So there's a lightness. There's an immense lightness, an immense need to cry and sob your heart out. I remember the day after I took my shahada, I called Gaza and my friend Yasser Kafana. Please keep him and all our family, uh, all the people in Gaza. He's in Rafa right now. Um, and they just got bombed again this morning. Um, I said, Yasser, I've accepted Islam. And he started to cry. He said... <sighs> I knew you would. And I said, how did you know? Because I didn't know. <laughs> he said, because all the people of Gaza were praying for you. SubhanAllah. We were all praying Allah. for you. Whenever we met, we Allah. said, let's pray for Sister Lauren Booth to become Muslim. And honestly, I felt that I had a hand on my back pushing me towards Islam. And was it that dua? Wallahu alam. And when you understand the, the dua of the oppressed, SubhanAllah, the weight that it carries in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Imagine so, and many of them yeah. were also praying for you, Subhanallah. Subhanallah. And he, when I told him, he said, "Okay, what you need to do now is you need to go and sit on your bed and cry." I said, "No, no, I feel amazing." He said, "Sister, I know you, and I know my Allah, and you, you need to go and sit on your bed." So when I hung up, I went and sat on my bed, and then it just came like a fizzing through my body, and I'm in my memory. I cried for six hours. Maybe I cried for an hour, maybe I cried for two hours, but it was one of those long, long, I cried until I had no more water in my body. Mm -hmm. And it was just letting go of the past. But then you have to learn how to be. Yeah. How do you learn how to be after that? Because you still have the same habits, you still have the same friends, you know, everything has to change and it takes time. Alhamdulillah. But in terms of your life now, Spala, I mean, it, it, you have achieved so much in not just talking about your journey, but also being able to highlight the injustices that we're seeing in the, in the Muslim world and obviously outside of the Muslim world as well. Mm. Uh, you, you, um, you've written, uh, you wrote a play, didn't you, uh, which was called Accidentally Muslim. And that was, you toured at the Ed Edinburgh Fringe. And tell us, the, the journey to writing that play. Why Why did you want to write a play? And maybe you can tell us a little bit about what the play was about. So, um, yeah, I, I wrote the play um, off the back of my book, which is a memoir um, of one person's uh, and life. And the memoir is called In Search of the Holy Land. In Search of the Holy Land. And what was the memoir? Just tell us about that first. So it, it's very much what we're talking about today. It's about having a celebrity family. It's about entering celebrity. It's about worshipping the nafs. It is about meeting famous people and being in a debased spiritual state. It is about honouring the promise I made. And much of my life is lived trying to honour promises I made to people in Palestine to tell their stories. They're telling their own stories now, which is brilliant. We're finally able to, to not need other people to speak about them. But still, I have things to say and may Allah accept it. So um, 
so that so I wanted to honor those experiences um which were not going to be shown in the mainstream and then about um taking shahada and what it is like the day after shahada so that's that's what um the book is about and one honestly after the book had been out about a year I woke up one morning a lot of things happen in dreams or in a dream state I woke up and I literally said ah, it's a play you fool I went what <laughs> what the word said that. it's a play you fool <laughs> And, and whoever was in the room, I don't remember, it was a daughter, who was it? I said, it's a play. And they said, what are you talking about? It's a play. It's, the book is a play. It's not a book, it's a play. Okay, I get it. And so that was December 2018. Maybe the book had only been out a few months. And January, I met a director, a Muslim director, and he said, I'm interested in this. And we had, and you'll know how hard this is, August is the Edinburgh Fringe. Mm. So you've got to write it, rehearse it, fund it, fundraise for it, and get a place at the Edinburgh Fringe. People start years in advance. Yeah. And so when did you start? We started in January 2019 well, January. And by... for August. Oh, well, that's a very short time frame. It was miracle after yeah, miracle. Uh, subhanallah. It was miracle after miracle. So we finished right. We we um. I started um asking, uh, inviting Muslims to invest in it, as it was going to be a dawa effort at the Edinburgh Fringe. Mm. In that, it was communicating things about Islam, and conversion that people won't have heard before. And get this, um, the uh, one of the biggest one of the biggest venues in the whole of the Edinburgh Fringe got back and said, we'd like you uh, with us. And I said, that's great, fantastic. And then the next day I, I realized, oh no, I'm gonna about, I've signed up to be in a room with people with alcohol and I'm gonna be reciting Quran. You cannot halalify haram. You cannot make that okay. You can't make it okay. I'm going to be sinning, pretending it's a good deal. I'm going to be sinning. So how did you undo it? I made, I prayed Ishtikara and I knew what's wrong is wrong and what's right is right. And so I rang them, their office, and I said, you know what, I'm really, really grateful that you've given me as a Muslim woman this opportunity, but I've realised I can't do it with alcohol in the room and I thank you very much. And um, I just want to say thank you, that's it. And they said, Lauren, wait, 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 wait. Can we get back to you? And I said, of course, but, you know, this is the Edinburgh Fringe. It's full of people drinking. That's the point, kind of the point of it, because uh, it's a non-Muslim culture. Culturally, that's it. Culturally, that's it's it. It's a festival. big party, party arts festival. Absolutely. So anyway, I, I, I kind of, you know, started to think over the next 24 hours about returning people's money, saying sorry to people, but I knew in my heart that I'd done the right thing. I knew in my heart I'd done the right thing. And then the next day I got a call and uh, the call was, Lauren, um, we won't put l let people drink while you're performing. We won't let people drink alcohol. We'll put a sign outside saying no alcohol in this event. Allah. Subhanallah. Allah's once that opened up a way for you because yes. where, where the heart intends on doing something good for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens all those avenues and doors for you. SubhanAllah. I absolutely lived that mm. moment. You know, because we must be sincere, we must be uh, content with Allah's decree, and we must be able to walk away from dunya uh, for the rights of Allah Ta'ala. That's the lesson I had to say to myself, are you ready to walk away from this? Or is it about you? Or is it about really communicating what Allah wants? And I went, well, yeah, it's about that. Alhamdulillah. We did 30 days, played to 900 people, majority non-Muslims. Um, what was the reception? It was How was it received? Brilliant. I'll tell you what. Um, what's his name? Um, Cas the Catholic um, Lawson. Dominic. No, not Dominic Lawson. What's the Lawson? Um, who is the who is the arts critic for the BBC? Mm -hmm. Oh, come on. You know him. He does, oh, it's a huge. He does his own show. He's um, for years. Lawson. Anyway. Let's call him Lawson. Lawson. Okay. <laughs> anyway, he came to see it. I was a bit nervous that night. But when you say Bismillah, and this is something we all need to re continually remind ourselves, in the name of Allah, you go out on stage for his sake. I did the show and he said something outside. He stayed behind and he said, um, your dad would have been really proud. And we both had tears in our eyes. My God. So he, so he 
had he been around? He must have been around at the he time. Was over, he was. He he knew my dad, and he you knew know, your father yeah, as yeah, well. that's right. They that. met, and because um, again, your your father was very well known in the acting yeah. world. And he gave, mm. he gave it a lovely review in, like, mm. the Catholic Herald or one of the... Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I to... so, so in this in this play, you were playing... You were, you were, was this a monologue? I'm sorry, it's a monologue, right? But you were performing different parts within mm. this entire monologue. Mm. How, how did you feel about doing that? Because we, we, don't, we don't see Sister Lauren as the actor, the performer. Well, surprisingly, uh, you know, I, I went to... I suddenly got a little bit nervous and thought, I haven't been on stage to act in 20 years. Who do I think I am? I, I haven't done this. Mm -hmm. And so I said to my director, I'm nervous. And he said, don't worry, you're not going to do any acting. You're just going to be delivering a monologue. And by the end of a month's rehearsal, he had me performing 17 different characters with different accents and, you know, acting a lot in this show. But that's a good director. Mm. He drew them out. I even had somebody come in and teach me how to mime, to, rem you know, mime getting on a ship. Yeah, it was all that stuff. We're doing all the kind of, it was a bit. I'm in a box. <laughs> yeah, I'm in That's a box. the door handle. <laughs> yeah. So I had to relearn some craft mm. because it was a craft. And um, it was a beautiful, beautiful experience. Alhamdulillah. It what is your uh, intention on bringing that back? Because obviously there are going to be a ton of people who have not seen it because it was yeah. at, the, at, the, at the festival. Yeah. Uh, the intention is always the same. It is to look at what it is, what Islam is and how people live it and the beautiful adventure of life as a spiritual human being, as a spirit with a human essence. Because we live most of our life in the unseen realm. Right. But what are our thoughts? We can't see them. Can we eat them? Can we touch them? When people so always say, I don't believe in God because I can't see him. It's like, can you see love? Mm. No. Does love exist? Yes. It shapes most of what you do. It's like love wind. or hate. You can see the impact of the wind when right? the tree burns, but you can't see the wind itself. But you know, it's there. So we live in this beautiful unseen realm and it's sharing mm. that. It's sharing beautiful moments like I want people to hear the Adhan for the first time. I want them to hear sections of Surah Baqarah. Um, I want us to explore what is the oneness of God. Uh, one, some of the great questions I've been asked, sometimes I do Q&As afterwards. Um, and, the, and the Christian audience will ask, usually one very um, pertinent person will ask this question. Okay, you liked Muslims, um, but you were a Christian. Um, what's the main difference? You didn't have to become a Muslim to love God. And I'm like, great question. The difference is this, oneness of Allah. He's not three. And there's no answer to that because it is pure Tawheed. Mm. As, as a community, and especially in light of what's going on in, in, in the world at the moment in terms of current affairs, you know, we're seeing a lot of focus on celebrity. We're seeing a lot of focus on influencers, on social media in general. As somebody who is... Uh, an activist, but also somebody who's who's quite um, um, prevalent on social media. What what are your fears or concerns about celebrity, about the state that we are in in terms of a community or kind of a global community, and perhaps our relationship with with media? Mm. Let's get. Let, I, I I want to bring up something here. Applause. Now, remember, I come from an acting background and the whole of um, performance art is about applause. Do you like it? Do you like it? How much do you like it, darling? Was I good? Was I well, How amazing was I? Which bit did you like the best? You can never run out of questions about your performance. Believe me, we can be the most needy, boring, uh, self-infatuated people. That's the world I come from. And it's the opposite of modesty, higher, calm, doing things with a higher purpose. So when I started giving talks in the Muslim community um, about Palestine and about a journey to Islam and different things, I would go on to a completely silent audience. It was the weirdest thing. I would walk on and in my mind I'd be going, tough crowd, tough crowd. Why aren't they clapping? Why aren't they clapping? And, you know, at the end, somebody might say takbir and then there'd be Allahu Akbar. And I was like, but no applause. And for me, it was like, am I no good? Have I lost my skill set? 
But people afterwards would say that was really moving. And gradually, as I learned the Dean, as I, as I listened to other speakers, for example, uh, some uh, Tariq Ramadan had a, an impact on me. We were both speaking for, I think it was some police event. They, I can't remember how that happened. But anyway, we'd been invited to the Met for something. And I remember him saying, please don't applaud. Don't applaud. I'm not here for applause. Yeah, I'm here to speak facts and about important issues. And then I saw him at another time with a Muslim audience, and he was even stronger. He said, do you know how decimating it is for our near, our intention, that you're clapping people who are talking about Allah Ta'ala's religion? Please, stop. Stop with your intention for worshipping us and stop making us, you know, um, attentive to your worship. Huh? So that was in 2010, 2012, 2013. I think we became scared of saying Allahu Akbar. Because around 2014, I started noticing, and here we have Lauren Booth. Rah! But the reason why, one of the, the reasons for that it is how Allahu Akbar has been associated with terrorism. Because when you look at reports in the media, when there's been some kind of incident around the world and they've blamed a Muslim, one of the things in the report mm. will always be the individual shattered Allah Akbar before detonating themselves or shooting X, Y, and Z. So there is a fear that literally has been created because we're worried about the association, but we almost have to reclaim that. Because Allah Akbar so. is, is one of the most beautiful and the most important words or phrases phrase that we can say because this is praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so why should we fear that? I think we have to be kind to each other. I think we have to say that on campuses, for example, you, c you can't ask too much of the ISOCs. They have too much, uh, you know, going on with approvals as it is. Asking them to, you know, let's say Allahu Akbar loudly on campus. Mm -hmm. That, I don't think we're there yet. But I think in our own spaces, what if it's in a mosque? Why are you clapping in a mosque? Why are you clapping at Nawab or somewhere else where we're, we're doing a fundraising event? We have to, When we have our own spaces, that's what shocks me. Not in the public, I get it. Be polite, fit in a little bit. We have, we have to do that for, for safety and for everybody's comfort, fine. But I'm questioning about our own spaces. So we, we move on to celebrity and we move on to influencers, social media. Mm. Is that force for good? Um, hmm. it, it's both, isn't it? It's absolutely both. It depends what are the qualities that we're bringing out in each other. I've always been very cautious about the modeling industry for, for sisters. Ew, I'm not comfortable with that personally. That doesn't mean that good, good people aren't in there. Someone like Halima, mashallah, her charity work, the way she talks about her mum, the way she's kind of um, questioned how the, uh, the the industry forces hijabi women who are models to to to, to, to um, compromise. She's done a great job, mm -hmm. but I think everybody who's so many of of us when we follow those are, are still jettisoning, jettisoning, in jettisoning. Mm, that's a horrible word. <laughs> Leaving our ideals behind for likes. That's, so, that's so here's hugely the thing. problematic. So, so, so for me, I mean, I've, I've come across a lot of influence. So there are some who are bringing people to Islam, or at least they are helping maybe the younger generation to connect with their faith. And I think that, alhamdulillah, is, is great. I mean, we know that the only influencer that we need is the Prophet, peace be upon him. That's Salam. right. Salam. And the only celebrities are, yeah. you know, we should who we should be applauding are the prophets and uh, the companions. But but what do you make of those influencers who, I mean, for example, I've seen some who just really focus on their own lives and it feels like this is what I do. I am an entrepreneur. I'm a business ah. person. I am a, I don't know, a you know, a, a father or I'm a mother or I'm, you know, and, and it's almost, it, it feels like it's more about self-promotion. And sometimes I do look at stuff just to, in trying, in, in a neutral way to say, right, how do I feel about this? Mm -hmm. And often or not, I, I'm not feeling positive about it because mm -hmm. for, in some respects, I, I'm not here to, I'm not going to judge people's sincerity, but sometimes those things I see on social media bit disingenuous and I feel it is about self-promotion but I don't know whether it's truly people feeling that they're making a difference 
or whether it's more about I feel like I can make money off the back of this. I, I'm trying to get my head around it, but I, I, I follow very, very few people. Yeah. On social these, media. These are, look, these are new industries. And are we, the, the question I'd pose to everybody is are we using our Muslimness to sell in the same way as we do if we were not Muslim? So my my issue is always seeing Muslims behave like non-Muslims, but either with brown skin and and using that. Would you like that. to make a oh, halal six-figure income? Yes. I can show you how I with a free course. Seeing oh, so much God, of that I stuff hate now, that. Yeah, and that wrong. for me, that's wicked. I think it becomes yeah. really obnoxious, really dangerous. Yeah. Using neurolinguistic programming. That's a whole other yeah. show, by the way. That is, you know, mm, we can do. We that can do well. that. We can do we that. We need to call that out. We do. There's some dangerous tactics going on out there. So, I'm so very uncomfortable. With. What would you say? What would your advice be? You've got a lot of. You're going to have a lot of people tuning in, especially young folk like myself who are tuned in. Yeah. Uh, why are you laughing? Rude. Yes. Age, uh, my age. <laughs> young people like ourselves yes. who are watching, and they are going to be influenced by influencers because that's kind of a whole point. You know, what is your message to them? Because I suppose we've been around for a while, you know, and I suppose when you get you get to see, I mean, we got to see things in the '80s and the '90s, and and kind of seeing how technology has developed understanding how media works inside and out but at the same time seeing what what the downsides can be what would your advice be to those who are watching thinking to themselves oh i'd love to be an influencer i'd love to start i don't know my own channel what would you say to them what would be your words of warning or words of wisdom this one it's as uh, simple as this you'll be raised on yom al-qayyam with the ones that you followed and worshipped and loved those who you're following, any of us, and we're liking and we're, we're worshipping. Because an act of worship is to copy. If we're not copy, copying the Prophet, wasalam, if we're copying a footballer's wife, if we're copying a, a hijabi uh, influencer who takes her hijab off, and we're like, oh, well, I will take it off as well because, you, you know, she seems like a good person. Um, if we are being tricked and allowing ourselves to be tricked, if we are really insincere with our with our with our love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then we are going to be raised with those people and that should be fearsome mm -hmm. enough. And we have to say to our hearts, who am I with? Are these people just and who am I following? And know that without without the the deen, that we're we're all at risk of being lost. We're all lost. We're not at risk of it. We're at loss. So look in your timelines. It's not just are these are these influencers making me feel better or worse? That's still very nafsy, 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 nafsy. It's what are they really promoting? Is it just another, it's just another fashion business? It's just another talk about me business. It's just another joke account. What we spend our time doing mm. is affecting and impacting our hearts. Are they, are they bringing us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I suppose ultimately that is the test. Mm. Is what they're doing a reminder mm. about the beauty of Allah, beauty of Islam, and about how we can enhance that relationship that we have with our creator perhaps that is that litmus test and then there's the other thing of you know the entertainment culture we do need to laugh and we do need to smile but i would say this those those couples who who do these kind of joke accounts <laughs> it comes at a cost for them it comes at a cost. I was the kind of writer when I started with the Daily Mail and the Mail on Sunday who wrote about this is my experience of moving house, this is my family, this is where I live. Yeah. And you, you, eventually I said things at, at times that were difficult that I would never say now that hurt people. And it's not a joke. Mm -hmm. And to put everything out there is to have everything judged in public, Right. And you do start slipping off because, as I said earlier, you look at the comments, you look at the likes, and you end up being led by that and far away from your original near. And imitation isn't necessarily a good thing. And, yeah. and I feel that as a community, yeah. we just seem to imitate and replicate. But in terms of that original thought or that original authentic idea... Some they're, they're, they're there. So but we not should we should really say here who do we follow that's amazing? Okay, I'll say one and then mm. you say one. Sure. I follow Dalia Ayub. She's Palestinian. She lives in uh, Turkey. Mm. She um, is trained in, in uh, Islamic, uh, uh, if not fiqh, then spirituality. Mashallah, tabarakallah. She's very knowledgeable and uh, she's beautiful reminders. So Dalia Ayub, 
I follow you. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> Hopefully that's uh, good. Dr. Umar Suleiman. Yeah, mashallah. That would be... I would say Natural. Sheikh Ali Hamouda, mm-hmm. who's a Palestinian, lives in um, in uh, Cardiff. Mm-hmm. Wonderful, wonderful reminders and uh, in de- in depth work as well. Mashallah. Low key. Low key, great information. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And and you, you know, we have different categories, don't we? We do because again, you've got your scholars, you've got your news. You've got your news, you've got your journalists, and you've got so, your entertainers as well. Yeah. And and that's what I love is mm. I love to see what people are saying about current events because those who have, have, have I suppose, relied upon the goodwill of their followers and put content out for their followers, are they also putting stuff out about what's going on right now? Are they putting their necks on the line? And I'm seeing that there are those who are, and there are those who are quite quiet as well. There's not a lot that's being said. And perhaps because there is a worry, perhaps because of the way that they're being funded, their part, you know, their, you know, the sponsorships, it could work that they're doing in, in, in the public domain as well. They're being very, very careful about what they're saying, almost kind of a bit hush. Can I say as well that, that you know, some of the greatest people that we we need to be learning from may do a live with 25 people on mm. you know it was some of some of our great scholars had four students or two students right but but their work is immortalized forever it by is Allah's grace. Like how many have learned from them it's, and have continued right to, it's a blessing and barakah in it I, so i agree i i really love to uh, learn from sheikh yahya rodas um he's a, an incredible scholar mashallah to barakallah mm. um i would really recommend uh learning from him Sister, what's next for you? What have you got planned? Because again, you've, with everything that you are known for as an author, activist, broadcaster, journalist, social activist, all of that good stuff, and now somebody who is comment, uh, commentating on, 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 on Turkish heritage as well mm. and culture. What what have you got planned that we may be able to see so in, in the coming weeks, months and years? Alhamdulillah, I'm currently on a tour with the UK Islamic Mission uh, for Gaza and we're fundraising for Trucks to Go full of aid and also for um, ambulances. I work with Ikra, Turkey, and we are doing an amazing show. Oh, this is so exciting. And it's called DIY Life Changers. Mm. And we take a poor family um, out of their home and surprise them by making a completely new place for them to live. And this will be in, in Turkey. places in Turkey. So that should that amazing. first show should be coming out very, very shortly. I'm very, very happy with that. I'm going to Syria, inshallah, with uh, Ikra. And we will be uh, looking at um, the conditions for families there. Don't forget Syria. We must not be so reactive. The people of Gaza won't mind if we also love Syria, if we also love Yemen. Look at the Yemenis. Do, do they Myanmar do they limit well, course, and Myanmar? Yeah. But do the Yemenis, may Allah be pleased with them, bless them and raise them, are they only worried about their starving? We have big hearts and we have a lot to you give. You can see the protests that are happening oh, in Yemen right incredible. now. Tens of thousands of people on the streets when we know how many how many have, been, have died through the, the bombing campaigns. They've come, I, I, the they've, come out, they've come out of, well, they're still in a partial famine. Mm. They're being bammed, ban, uh, bombed and boycotted and yet they're still coming out and saying, by Allah, this is a just cause. So may we be amongst those people, inshallah. I'm going I to mean, Bosnia three times this year. Um, taking people to really see that beautiful space. And as you said, my fascination is also with the um, Ottomans and the Adab. And if I can give one last thought, it's this. Um, The Prophet, peace be upon him, came to teach manners. If we uh, know how to put down a cup nicely or close a door quietly or clean a place that was dirty, when we go in and leave it better, we're actually spreading the light of the prophetic message. SubhanAllah. Sister, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you immensely for all the great work that you that you have done and you continue to do. And may it be a, a sadaqah jari for you and for your loved ones as well. It's been, I mean, and it's been a, a real pleasure because this is something we haven't done we in haven't a very, done. very long time. We've done a lot of fundraising together. We have, in the we past. have, we have. But it was probably it, a bit raw back then. Oh, we were, yes, <laughs> yes. I think we've learned a few things since then, but it's... It doesn't feel like time has passed at all. And it, again, you, uh, mashallah, you're in, really inspirational to us. And it's been a, actually an honor that 
I got this opportunity to interview you. So thank you so much. Astaghfirullah. Allah bless us all. I mean, I mean, I mean, that's all we have time for. Sadly, I think we could have gone on for another two, three hours. But alas, unfortunately, not enough tape in the camera. But uh, this has been podcast on Islam channel. And until the next episode, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.